Greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. My name is Steve Dace. His name is Aaron McIntyre, and his name is Totters. And what's your name? Let us know. By emailing the program steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Steve Day Show. Also look for us on MeWe, Parlor, Gab, and Getter. Speaking of social media platforms, did you see my prediction from the Dace Group came true from a couple of weeks back? That Trump would soon announce the launch of his social media oh, yeah. platform and it would not be called Trumper, Trumper or Trumpist or Trump anything like uh, what was being uh, talked about for the last year plus. Or cuck. I, yeah, I just know it's not or called. Or cuck, what which, is what, been which called. is what we wanted it to be called, yes. Uh, in fact, I actually knew what the name was. I just, I figured if I predicted what the name was going to be, that it was going to be Truth Social. Um, it might out my source. So, so you guys know, the reason I got that prediction right is I had a little insider trading. Uh, somebody I know is involved in that project and came to me about a month ago and asked me if I wanted to pre-secure my uh, validation, verification for this platform if I agreed to check out the beta version of it for them. So that's kind of how I knew that this was going to go down. So does it still count as a good prediction if you actually knew it was going to happen ahead of time? Does uh, it still count? What do I need to say to uh, make sure the check clears? <laughs> Right answer. Let's move on. Uh, you can also get clips of the program over at rumble.com slash Steve Dace Show. That's rumble.com slash Steve Dace Show. And again, the last name is D-E-A-C-E. Big announcement to start off the show today. Our friends over at Built Bar, it's not just a new flavor in blueberry muffin. It's not just their absolute best, which is very good, by the way. It's not just an ab their absolute best flavor, if you ask me. Chocolate chip cookie dough is back. But now the coconut puffs that everybody loves, those are now back at Built Bar as well. The absolute best tasting protein bar you've ever had, and it rivals, if not exceeds, numerous candy bars on the market as well. It just doesn't have... The calories, the sugars, uh, the carbs that those uh, candy bars have. Instead, it's got almost none of that while being very high in protein. And it comes in even, even the most decadent flavor they've made that I'm aware of. The coconut brownie chunk, I think, is like 170 calories. That's it. You can't beat it. Use my last name, Dace, as your promo code right now to get 15% off at built.com, B-U-I-L-T, built.com, promo code Dace. All right, coming up here on the show today, we will play our weekly game of three non-political questions because approximately 7,000 of you have requested this. And I'm only probably slightly exaggerating. You can stop sending me the link to John Piper's take on jabbing for Jesus, all right? And, and it's, what's funny, too, is I love you guys. Like, 90% of you are like, you know what, man? I'm probably the 10,000th person to send this to you, but just in case you missed it, I'll send it to you anyway. I appreciate that because there have been plenty of times in the last couple of years where you've sent me something thinking everybody else has sent it to me and it's the first time I've seen it and it was something I needed to see. Now, for those you know, of you who do that, the first time you don't do that, yes, we're never going to see it. That's exactly right. You know, And so, yes, it gets a little laborious hitting the delete button in my inbox repeatedly times 100 but you know what's even more annoying than that is the fact that I'm not omniscient. I'm not omnipresent. I cannot be everywhere and know everything. And then the one time somebody, as you just said, Aaron, does not send something like that to me, it is something I should have seen so we can do. So yes, by popular demand, today on Theology Thursday, we will tackle John Piper's piece advocating jabbing for Jesus. Now, I have on purpose, and Aaron, back me up on this, when I made the decision three days ago, we were or two days ago, we were going to do this. I also made the decision, so it's not me just being lazy, coming up with an excuse. On purpose, I've not read this. On purpose. And because I wanted to just react to it without any preconceived notions whatsoever and analyze it in real time. For those of you that don't know who John Piper is, because you're not part of evangelical subculture, he's a pretty big deal. And uh, he's been a big deal to me. If you like this show, if you like how we roll, then he gets some level of credit. I mean, there's a 
there's a group of Christian thinkers and podcasts and and authors and theologians that have been heavily influential on my worldview leading up to the product that you see now. And he is certainly one of them. He's been made famous by the Babylon Bee, like always coming off the top rope. And- yes, yes. So, I mean, he's a powerful preacher, powerful. And he's been a blessing to me and so many others. I don't take this on lightly, believe me. That's why we also reached out to Desiring God uh, to see if we could get John Piper on the show. We got absolutely nowhere with that, though, right? I did not hear back. Okay, but we, we did offer that, all right? We did offer that. So I will react and analyze this for Theology Thursday at the top of hour two, live, hot. I have not read it whatsoever. I don't know anything in it. I just know what it's advocating. That, and so we will discuss it live and in real time for Theology Thursday next hour. At the bottom of this hour, I had a chance to be on a podcast recently called uh, Informed Dissent, where healthcare and politics collide. One of the co-hosts of that podcast really enjoyed my time. Smart guys. One of the co-hosts of that podcast is going to join us here at the bottom of the hour. We're specifically going to get into the push to vaccinate the kids with the COVID therapeutics. We'll get into that here at the bottom of the hour. You don't want to miss it. But before we get to all of that, of course... We begin with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by Passing the Buck. A letter from the National Institutes of Health Deputy Director Lawrence Tavick to the House Committee on Oversight and Reform was obtained by Rutgers University Professor Richard E. Bright, and boy howdy is it something else. Remember Dr. Francis Collins, director of the NIH, announced his retirement recently. The letter pertains to the origins of Wuhan coronavirus and questions about the funding of dangerous gain-of-function research by the NIH. The deputy director states in the letter that funding to EcoHealth Alliance did happen to study bat coronaviruses. Quote, the limited experiment described in the final progress report provided by EcoHealth Alliance was testing if spike proteins from naturally occurring bat coronaviruses circulating in China were capable of binding to the human ACE2 receptor in a mouse model. Tabak explains that this research led to some mice becoming sicker than others, which was an accidental outcome, but stuff like that, quote, sometimes occurs in science. The letter goes on to say that the research plan was reviewed by the NIH and was determined not to be a study of enhanced pathogens of pandemic potential and was not subject to departmental review. Tabak goes on to spell out that, quote, out of an abundance of caution and as an additional layer of oversight, language was included in the terms and conditions of the grant award to EcoHealth that outlined criteria for a secondary review, end quote. Further, Tabak passes the buck to EcoHealth Alliance, saying they failed to report the accident with the mice to the NIH and have five days to report any unpublished data to the National Institutes of Health. Finally, the letter wraps up by making the case that the research on specific viruses in question in the letter are not and could not be genetically related to Wuhan coronavirus. Here's the short version of this letter. The NIH is now admitting it funded research that accidentally made a virus that made some mice sicker than others, but it's EcoHealth Alliance's fault for not abiding by the framework of the grant they were given by the NIH. Furthermore, the NIH is assuring us that there's no possible way that this virus in question is related to SARS-CoV-2. Moving on and heading to Florida, where Governor DeSantis is redoubling his efforts to protect his state from COVID stan. So we have an opportunity here uh, to take additional action. I think we have to do it. I think we have got to stand up for people's jobs and their livelihoods. At a press conference in Clearwater, Florida this morning, DeSantis announced he's calling a special session of the state legislature to address vaccine mandates and firm up the prohibition of mask mandates in schools. In other news, Condoleezza Rice went on The View yesterday to talk about critical racist theory. Let me be very clear. I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't go to a movie theater or to a restaurant with my parents. I went to segregated schools till we moved to Denver. Mm -hmm. My parents never thought I was going to grow up in a world without prejudice, but they also told me that's somebody else's problem, not yours. You're going to overcome it and you are going to be anything you want to be. And that's the message that I think we ought to be sending to kids. One of the worries that I have about the way that we're, we're talking about race is that it either seems so big that somehow white people now have to feel guilty for everything that happened in the past. I, I mm-hmm. don't think that's very productive. Or black people have to feel disempowered by mm-hmm. race. I would like black kids 
to be completely empowered, to know that they are beautiful in their blackness, Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, I don't have to make white kids feel bad for being white. Representative Premier Jay Paul has some thoughts. The president is the inspirer. He is the closer. He is the convincer. The mediator. He, <laughs> the mediator in chief. He really is doing a phenomenal job. Checking in on Joe Biden. I'd ride every day. I, I commuted every single day for 36 years as pres vice president of the United States. Gender confused Netflix employees staged a walkout yesterday in protest of the company's support of the Dave Chappelle comedy special. Uh, first, can I get your name on tape? Yeah, my name is David Huggard. I'm a non-binary individual. I also go by the persona of Eureka O'Hara. Yeah, I know it's important to be out here today because we have to stand in solidarity with each other. As a non-binary person, we as trans people and non-binary people aren't getting visibility or respect in the entertainment industry to begin with. And to have something like Dave Chappelle's special not be noted that it's, it's promoting discrimination and hate conversation is very um, hurtful to the activism and the cause that we're trying to progress ourselves in the industry. The U.S. Department of State tweets, quote, Today is International Pronouns Day. We share why many people list pronouns on their email and social media profiles. And finally, the WNBA is quickly becoming one of the most popular sports in America, and the Chicago Skies championship parade through that city is a testament to that. Take a look. And that's what happened while we were away. That video, dude. There are dozens of us. Dozens. I mean, that, wow. Uh, Aaron's montage brought to you by, if you like my glasses, better spectacles. If you don't, then just tune out here for about the next minute or so while I tell you about them. Uh, they've got now authentic German-engineered Rodenstock eyewear available for the first time here in the U.S. If you're wondering what that looks like, that's what I'm wearing. Uh, Rodenstock is a 144-year-old company, the world's gold standard, with over 500 patents. And now you can marry that brilliant hand craftsmanship to difficult prescriptions, which is, I also have. I have to wear progressives. I'm a little far-sighted, a little nearsighted, because you know me. I, I just can't fit into anybody's binary choice system other than the only real binary choice, which is male or female. Um, but, and I, I can't fit into that. It was fitted for me like it was fitted for all of us. Amen. 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 But in this case, if you've got a problematic prescription or maybe just a regular one, but you want access to those uh, uh, Rodenstock eyewear frames as well, check out our friends at betterspectacles.com slash Steve. Go there, schedule a teleoptical appointment. You won't even have to leave your house. This isn't just an online company. Uh, they give you the same experience online with their same expert opticians that you'd get if you went into one of their stores. All right. They're now offering you guys a 61% introductory offer, 61% off now when you marry their Go Spec lenses with those free handcrafted rodent stock frames to fill your prescription. Again, at betterspectacles.com slash Steve. Go now to betterspectacles.com slash Steve. In today's overtime, and I was inspired to do this. Uh, after our conversation yesterday with uh, our weekly prophet of woe and lamentation, Daniel Horowitz, and he laid out why what's gone on here with the denial and deconstruction and smearing of early treatments is a genocide. By the way, I listened to two podcasts that are part of our network here yesterday. I, I, every one of you need to listen to these. The first is uh, that I want to mention is from that aforementioned Daniel Horowitz from his podcast at the Conservative Review, and it's a it's an interview that he did with a well-respected Brazilian physician who has seen and treated thousands of COVID patients. And what he has seen works in terms of early treatment and what does not, all right? This is absolutely a conversation you want to hear. The second is our colleague, Ali Stuckey, her podcast. It's called Relatable, if you were not previously aware. She did an interview with Dr. Pierre Corey, who is one of the leading advocates of ivermectin as an early effective treatment for COVID. And she asked all the right questions. And, and, and he is absolutely fantastic, which is good news. Because the first subject matter expert that we have lined up 
in the lawsuit that we announced on Monday, which you guys funded in a, less than 24 hours, uh, to get justice for my friend, the Marine, who was denied his ivermectin prescription by Walmart. We're going to file a federal lawsuit now that's already been fully funded. We've got enough money now to take this thing all the way to the Supreme Court, should it go that far. Thank you. The first subject matter expert we've lined up in that case, do you know who it is? I think I do. It's Dr. Pierre Corey. Yeah, that's what I thought. Is the first subject matter expert we have lined up in that case. And if you want to get it, you want to get, I've only seen his stuff online. And so I, you know, I, I listened to this originally trying to, you know, I wanted to see, all right, let, let me see how this guy might perform on the stand. Wow. Is he incredibly dynamic? And Allie, again, asked all the right questions and he brings receipts, man. He brings the receipts. That is a podcast you don't want to miss. I thought I thought I knew a lot about this subject. I, I learned quite a bit listening to both of these podcasts yesterday. So again, get Daniel's with the Brazilian doctor, get Allie's with Pierre Corey. But um, in the overtime today, after listening to Daniel talk on the show about this genocide of denial of early treatment, I wanted to know how could we quantify something like that? So I'm going to I'm going to send these numbers out on social media later today. But if you are a Blaze TV subscriber, you're going to get them first. I'm going to I'm going to walk you through one early treatment. Just one. Just one of them. And and its level of effectiveness. And we're going to put a number on it. On on lives that could have been saved. If this thing had been more readily available and promoted. And, and then we're going to compare those numbers. Again, this is just from one of these. One of them. We're going to compare these numbers to some of the worst, most tragic, deadly days or events in the history of this country. And you're going to see why, again, I'm not playing around. And I'm not just going for some clickbaity headline or some uh, clever turn of phrase. When I'm talking Nuremberg-level tribunals. With Nuremberg level verdicts and punishments, roll out the gallows, line them up. They have killed people. We'll get into that today in the overtime. BlazeTV.com slash Dace. We will record it for you right after today's show, and then you'll be able to download it and watch it on demand from there later. That's also where you can go, BlazeTV.com slash Dace, to become a subscriber today for a discount. Again, at blazetv.com slash dace. Let's get to the montage. Uh, you know an issue, a culture war issue is very bad and has gone way too far when the bush wing shows up on the view to lay down ordinance. When the bush wing shows up on the view, Condoleezza Rice, pro-baby killing, Condoleezza Rice, pro-rainbow jihad. But this is now where the Bush wing is going to put its marker down. It's had enough. If the Bush wing thinks, dude, we've got to come out to the freaking view of all places and say something about this, where do you think the rest of the country is when they hear about this critical race theory stuff? I'll tell you. For, I'll give you anecdotally my own mom. My own mom, I've said this story a million times. She's voted for one Republican her entire life, Ronald Reagan, 1980. Teen mom, old school Democrat, thinks people, the government ought to do things for people they can't do for themselves, hates communism, hates Marxists. So she's not really voting for a lot of people, actually, these days. She just hates them. She hates them all. God bless her. All right. But you know what she really can't stand? The race baiting stuff. Oh, my gosh. She just freaking hates it. And I hear words come out of her mouth when she talks about it that it's probably been since I was a disrespectful, unruly teenager Many, many moons ago, I've heard these sorts of words from my mama. She loathes it, unbiblically loathes it. Why? Because she was 14-year-old white trash pregnant. 15-year-old white trash mama. She got an education. She raised her baby, went back to college, made something of herself, yeah, she was on food stamps and government assistance and ADC for a while. But the idea that there's just perpetual victimhood, that you have a, just a, a perpetual uh, you know, receipt to not have to make something of your life, which is exactly what you hear Condoleezza Rice talking about in that clip, by the way. Yeah, my mama's not playing that. 
okay? And she, like, hates Donald Trump with the heat of a thousand suns, okay? So if the Condoleezza, if, 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 if the Bush wing is sending Condi Rice out of the bully to shut down this rally in the ninth inning on the friggin' view, that tells you right there this issue is cosmically toxic everywhere. Pretty much everywhere except for, like, 20 college towns in America. Fair? Oh, yes. Yeah, and that's... And you can see she's getting applause from the view audience for saying this stuff. A little bit. The dude, that's a lot more than yeah. you than anybody else gets on there. Okay? That is I, I I think that just tells you how toxic this has become. How toxic the school board issue has become. Now Terry McAuliffe wants to down there in that Virginia gubernatorial race now wants to do interviews. Well, of course I think parents should have some say. Yeah. This just goes to show you how toxic these things are. The culture war issues have actually been, <laughs> this is why it sucks being in the Republican Party. And this is why Trump won in 2016. And they had to steal it from him in 2020. Because he recognized, you know, these flashpoint culture war issues beginning with immigration. He, folks, I was at his very first campaign event in Iowa. He didn't talk about anything involving the culture war at all. Didn't know why he's a New York lib, guys. Donating money to Al Sharpton, man. All right? Hanging out with Snoop Dogg and Elton John at galas and balls. They're, of course, now calling him homophobic racist, right? These were his peeps. His very first event in Iowa, I was there. The whole damn event was about trade policy in China. He didn't care about any of this stuff. God bless him when he recognized you did, though. Suddenly, man, dude took a di deep dive in the pool. All right? Always he, cared about this. That's right, because he ain't nothing if not an opportunistic businessman. When he sees what will, what will get you to what, the buy, what your buy sign is, now that's what separates him from other Republicans. The difference is Trump came to this not knowing what you think really on anything about these issues or even caring. But he was actually interested in your business. So when he saw, wow, that's the buy sign. That's what y'all want. I'll give you what you want because I want to sell it to you. These Republicans, they already knew what your buy signs were. They don't want to sell it to you. That's the difference between Trump and them for all of Trump's problems and why there is this incredible loyalty to him. If you really want to know, it really just comes down to this. Trump is willing to sell you what you, the product you want. McConnell and the people that run the Republican Party want to turn you into the customers they prefer to have. That is the difference. That's the difference right there. That's where the loyalty comes from. That right there. He's actually transactional. The Republican leadership claimed to be transactional. They just lied about that. They weren't. It was just an excuse not to actually address any of the issues you cared about. So keep nominating John McCain, Mitt Romney. Keep losing your ass because they don't address issues like shutting Chick-fil-A down. It's not a part of their campaign. Remember when Mitt said that? Mm -hmm. The culture war issues are the key to beating these guys, actually. It's the economic stuff people don't freaking care about and have given up on. And at this point, just don't care if government does everything. The culture war issues are the key to beating these guys. Not jobs, jobs, jobs. It's the culture war issues. The problem is we're aligned in a political party with folks who largely agree with the people we're against on the culture war issues instead of us. That's the issue. That's our problem. Furthermore, you want to talk about problems. That letter last night from NIH is a holy bleep event. We're about 10 minutes away from an OJ if I did it. It doesn't use the phrase gain of function. It just lays out exactly what it is in detail. It doesn't use the terminology. It just says what we did. What they did is gain of function research. That's the name for what is described in that note. It is clear Anthony Fauci has lied to the media. 
lied to Rand Paul in Congress, testifying to the Senate. More importantly, lied to all of us, the people who rule in this country. Now, the idea, well, they did the exact sort of gain of function research with bat coronaviruses, but they didn't, that, that probably caused COVID-19, created it, but they didn't create COVID-19 is beyond laughable. It's like if OJ came out and said, yeah, man, I knifed this hot blonde and her lover, but I didn't knife that hot blonde and her lover, okay? Wasn't me. <laughs> Blood on my hands, fingerprints on the knife, but it wasn't me. I was just knifing another blonde and her lover. That ain't going to fly. That dog ain't going to hunt. We are getting closer and closer to the truth here. And the beauty of this too is, the more of this stuff that comes out, the more likely it is, if Congress changes hands after the next election, there will be some real accountability. Why? It's not because I trust the Republicans. It's because I don't. They know they have to give you and I content. They know this. They know they cannot just go up there and every day is just nothing we can do. Thank you. They know that. They know this. They know they need a deterrent. They know they need an alternative narrative to we're just going to fund every one of Joe Biden's continuing resolutions and budgets because it can't have a government set down. They know they can't do that. And now there's going to be so much of this information in the media already. For those of you that don't know, Richard Ebright is a very well-respected scientist at Rutgers, a longtime critic of gain-of-function research, by the way. Not one of us either, just so you know. Well-respected academic. This is the perfect passion play to put on as an alternative to selling out on everything else. Because it also, frankly, is far more important for us to get answers to than winning some stupid budget battle when we're already trillions of dollars in debt anyway. And we already were before this president and the last one and the one before that. Do I think it's a smoking gun? No. Do I think it is a forerunner to one? I mean, this... I, this is the John. This is the John the Baptist of smoking guns. This is the Herald. We now know they were doing this research. We now know they were doing this research through Echo Health Alliance. You start putting together circumstantial cases, and eventually circumstances begin to add up. And then you start looking at all the various circumstances you have confirmed. And ask yourself, so we still don't have the patient zero bat that the virus came from. But we have confirmation that you did all the sorts of things that would have led to the creation of this virus. And you still want to deny you created it and we're just going to take your word for it. Hell to the no. I hesitate to say this just because the last few years have taught me not to. But I, I texted this to a friend of mine last night. It, it, it's starting to feel at least a little bit like the tide is turning here. At least a little bit. Doesn't it? It does to me. But again, the last couple of years have taught me don't have any hope. More in a moment. Well, you know, after a lot of these shows, if you tune in, you might feel a little worn out. You might need a little um, a little come down. And that's why you want to check out our friends over at Patriot Wine. They've got vineyards down in Argentina, 
9,000 feet high in the Andes Mountains there, uh, run by families that have been doing this for over 200 years, passed down generation after generation. We're talking some of the best Malbec grapes in the world, 90-point wine here, uh, some of the best foreign wine that you could get imported here into the United States, and it tastes great. Each of us have had it. In fact, I've got so much of this still at home. We just got another shipment. I just gave it all to you guys. And I see that it's not here any longer. So clearly it took you guys about three seconds to split that up. Right? I see that it's not here in my home any longer as well because it's good and I've been drinking it. All right. So uh, it's got notes of uh, dark cherry, blackberry, leather, smoke, not loaded with sugars or chemicals. Taste great. If you want to try it right now, all you've got to do, no promo code necessary, get half off right now, 50% off when you head over to this website, patriotwine2021.com. Again, that is Patriot Wine. 2021.com. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a chance to be on a podcast uh, with a couple of really smart guys. One of the, the smarter conversations I've been able to have about COVID uh, in all the interviews I've done uh, for the last uh, 19 months. Uh, it's called Informed Dissent. It focuses and fixates on the intersection between healthcare and public policy. One of the co hosts, of that podcast joins us now. Dr. Mark McDonald is here with us. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you with us on Blaze TV Radio and Podcast, man. How are you? I'm great. I could actually use a glass of wine, even though it's only 930 in the morning. <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere, brother, right? <laughs> it always is, isn't it? <laughs> give really us a little, the invitation. Get, Mark, give us a little bit of your background as we get started here. Sure. Well, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I practice in West Los Angeles. I see children, adolescents, and adults. I have for about 12 years. I also do some medical legal consulting, uh, as well as uh, individual and group family therapy. So I'm really a clinician. Uh, I'm not a politician. Uh, I'd like to be a writer. I am publishing a book soon uh, focused on my work and my observations around society. But I've really uh, been rather inactive in politics and public life for my entire career. It was only a couple of years ago when I started to become truly concerned about what I was seeing in my patient practice and how it was being expressed and displayed outside in the larger urban area of Los Angeles where I live and of course the nation at large, that I started to question things, I started to write, I started to speak up, I started to uh, give presentations and, and interviews because I really want uh, to bring this country back to where it was before uh, and out of this uh, what I call pandemic of fear really. That's the name of the book you have coming out here in a couple of weeks, Pandemic of Fear. Uh, it, I think it's available for pre-order on Amazon right now, correct? Should be soon. Not okay. quite yet, but it will be within the next seven to 10 days. All right. We've used the term PSYOP a lot on our show over the last 19 months. Is that justified given what you have seen as a clinician from just a purely data treatment medical background? We come at, we see you're coming at the political arena because you're seeing it impact the health of your patients, Right. We're coming exactly. at health because we're seeing it impact the, 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 the righteousness of public policy in America. So you and I are on the we're, we've come to meet here at this intersection from coming from opposite directions. Is the term psyop? Or is, is that justified here? Or are we just using that maybe because it's it's got some you know political connotations? But are, do you think it's justified that that's what's going on here? A year and a half ago, I would have said you're nuts. Uh, Steve, I would have said this is uh, conspiracy theory, uh, fear mongering. I mean, I was definitely and have always really been on the side of uh, middle science, reason, let's not go overboard. But I have to say, having followed this closely for now almost two years, I think that term is justified. I'll, I'll explain why. I am convinced that from the very beginning, this pandemic and then very quickly soon after it started, this push for uh, universal coerced vaccination and all of its machinations and job firings and keeping kids out of school, mass distancing, all of this stuff. None of it, not, not any of it, was ever about health. It was always about control. And I believe that the control was being fed and is being fed off of the fear of innocent Americans, and now in particular, parents of children. So I think that PSYOP appropriately encapsulates that because it punctures the lie that we are debating public health policy. We are debating uh, good and bad, risk and benefit. I don't think that that's true. I think that's a distraction from the 
overarching motivation, which is complete, total control of our population. I've laid out this chain of events to our audience. Tell me if you agree or disagree, again, looking at it from the clinician side of this equation, okay? That the mask mandates were done to, to condition you for vaccine mandates. Vaccine mandates were done to condition you for giving over your bodily autonomy. And once you hand over your bodily autonomy, you are essentially now just given over. Agree or disagree with I that? I completely agree with that. And I think that's an excellent way of framing this. The term dress rehearsal has been used for quite some time. We're in essentially a theatrical production and we're in a series of dress rehearsals for the end game. This is not about a vaccine. This is not about a mass. It's not about social distancing. These are all ratcheting effects. They're little tests mm. that government, corporations, bureaucrats, in other words, people who hold some form of power over us have used to see what is our limit? What are we willing to say no to? Is there anything we're willing to say no to? Mm -hmm. And when there's pushback, there's a de-ratchet. And then there's a pause. There's maybe an apology. There's a delay, a distraction. And then the ratchet goes forward. And I believe that the ultimate end game is really like a Chinese system of government where we are controlled by each other and the government using coercion, using kit, uh, sticks and carrots, and some form of very advanced technology, uh, such as uh, these uh, QR codes, cell phones, tracking devices, GPS satellites, all these computer chips embedded in automobiles and entryways in uh, businesses, uh, biometric scanning and cameras in public places. This exists right now in China. This is not fantasy. So I think that your description of going step by step by step towards a, a sense of, uh, of dominance and a state of authoritarianism, I think is a very, uh, very apropos way of uh, explaining what's been happening. I completely agree. Let's talk about the kids, Mark. Uh, my wife has just started a therapist practice um, with, with, with a large therapy firm here, a Christian therapy firm here in Des Moines. Uh, she finished her second master's at Liberty University, began her practice September 1st. So she's really new at this. They are overloaded, Mark, with kids and teenagers. They, 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 there's quite a few therapists that work within this large practice. They, they just they, they have to turn kids and, and, and stuff away. And again, this is a Christian therapy clinic. So a lot of these, not everybody, but a lot of these kids are coming from families where there is an added spiritual framework in the home that treated them as more of a mind, body, soul from, you know, from most of their life, as opposed to just your, your, a secular version of raising kids. And yet with all the strains that have been put on them uh, and the things that they are witnessing right now in society, even with that added benefit of a, an additional spiritual framework, they are struggling to process things. They're, they're, um, and, and, and the amount of anxiety, the amount of kids that are on anxiety medications or uh, these sorts of things right now that even at a Christian therapy clinic where they're going to be very hesitant about, they're actually going to run to prescribe things to people. They're going to see if we can deal with things on an emotional or spiritual level first. That even they're finding that they have to that they are deploying medication more than ever before before they can even address these kids as issues on a on a on a spiritual and emotional level. What are you seeing in your practice? I've seen my practice just explode in the last year and a half. Absolutely explode. I don't have a single open spot for the next 10 days. I have a mixture of primarily secular patients from Los Angeles, the West Side, Santa Monica, Malibu, and Interestingly, more recently, I've seen an enormous influx of what I would say are self-described uh, religious conservatives from as far south as San Diego, as far north as San Francisco, driving in, bringing their children to see me. Some of it's for mask mandate, exemptions, vaccine exemptions, but a lot of them are just bringing them in because their kids are falling apart. Even with that additional grounding from the church, from the family, the values, the exposure that they have, even in religious schools, Catholic schools, to this toxicity of anxiety, fear mongering, irrationality, mm -hmm. this uh, bizarre, I mean, children notice it right away, this bizarre uh, piecemeal implementation of what I had just said earlier, non-health based policies, their control policies, like keep your mask on as you walk in the school, uh, take it off when you have a snack, 
put it back on when you stand up to go to the bathroom, take it back off when you leave the front door. Kids don't understand this. They, it doesn't make sense to them. And eventually they get very anxious because they recognize, maybe not intellectually, but they recognize emotionally that there's something insecure about this. As I say in my book, there was a woman that I interviewed recently. Uh, I believe she lives in Canada. And she said she would go outside every morning and she would see these men, tough guys out in the country with gun racks and cats and camo, and they had masks on. And she said, I didn't feel secure yeah. when I saw that. It made me feel insecure. Mm -hmm. And I think children are feeling more and more insecure because they can see that this doesn't make sense. They see that this isn't about safety, but they don't know what they're unsafe from. They can't see this virus. They don't know anybody that's gotten sick from it. All they hear is that there's this disaster looming over the horizon. And if we act in these superstitious fashions, we put these masks on, take them off, stand up, sit down, turn in a circle, we're going to be safe. Kids don't buy that. So that's what leads to the anxiety, the depression, the confusion, the bedwetting, the nightmares. We are essentially, as parents, as adults, we are essentially abdicating our roles as protector of our children. Yep. I even go this far. I would say that we are offloading. We are, in psychological terms, we are projecting our own anxiety and fear as adults onto our children. And they are becoming the heat sinks, the receptacles for our fear. And that is truly evil. That is abuse. That's the last thing I wanted to ask you about here. We got about three minutes. This is where I think we should absolutely finish this conversation. Is part of what's driving this, you know, you, you mentioned the story of the woman in your upcoming book who didn't feel safe around these men who had a lot of the hallmarks of the things that would make her feel safe. But when she saw how fear based they were, you start wondering, are they going to turn those things against me now? If they if I make them feel unsafe, do the children feel as if because they know they know that none of their classmates, it's, some, it's, it's less than 500 children have died with COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. They know their classmates aren't the ones in the hospital. Right. They, they know this. They're not stupid. But yet mask up all day, dehumanize yourself because the morbidly obese cat lady teacher you have who's fully vaccinated still is what goes home and is convinced that this thing is going to infect her while she wears her mask in her car. So you have to dehumanize yourself for her. OK, you now have to now we're going to force these things on the children at the same time we're admitting they're failing. And that's why we have to do a third round of boosters in, in less than a year. We've never, never done a vaccination program like this in the history of science or medicine. And so now we're going to experiment on the kids, too, because, well, it might not be safe for you, like in your state of California, as Newsom recently said, for you to be in a school. They know that they're not the ones going to the hospitals. They're not the ones predominantly getting sick with this. And so they're being told, though, that they could still be killers of other people. What does that, what does that do in terms of dehumanizing them on a human level? This absolutely destroys a child's sense of confidence. Today in the LA Daily News, there was this urgent, urgent plea, retweeted, requoted, reprinted from the US Surgeon General about why we must start pushing down the vaccines to age five and then down to age six months for these kids. The reason being that if we were to do this, suddenly we'd be safe. Suddenly the kids would be safe. Suddenly we could reopen the schools. Everybody, could, everything could get back to normal. Essentially, what they're saying is, we put you all in prison, and now we're going to give you a key to get out, and they, they, we want you to bow down and kiss our feet and thank us for releasing you from the prison that you've been in for so long, you forgot that we actually jailed you into it. When we do this to children, it causes the kids to start to fear themselves. Yeah. Children should feel not only protected from the adults and from the evil, they should also feel confident, safe, secure, that they themselves are intrinsically good. And that if they do have a little bit of bad in them, it's something that they can get over and their parents will be able to help them with. When you tell a child that you're just a walking infestation of plague, how is that going to affect a child's development? How is that going to affect a child five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line? Because if my I can concern, infect you on this, then how do I get over the, I, my, I broke up with my boyfriend and girlfriend. I don't know. Maybe I can't get over exactly that. Right. I got cut from the team. I was, and I, after I worked all that's year long, maybe problem. I can't get over that, right? It lasts forever. It becomes what's called a trauma. It's like a permanent injury. It's not like a sunburn. It's like a scar. Mm. And a scar, t a scar is made up of tissue that is less strong. It is weaker than original skin. You can always rip it open. And we're gonna have children with these emotional scars, the developmental scars that will persist a lifetime and at every stage of their life, this will come back to them. 
we're going to have a generation of Americans who are traumatized, a generation of adults who are going to be living in their parents' basements until they're in their middle ages. This is a disaster. We have to stop this now. We have to call it out. We have to own our anxiety as adults. We have to stop using these children as scapegoats and allowing the government to do the same. It's evil. That's the word to end this on. Mark, let people know, where can they pick up you guys' podcast? And again, tell them about the book. Absolutely. So Dr. Jeff Barkey and I, we post a podcast, and you were gracious enough to come on as our guest recently, called Informed Dissent, which can be found at informeddissentmedia.com. You can also find it on many of the podcasting sites such as Spotify and Google Podcast and Buzzsprout. I am also publishing a book through Bombardier Post Hill Press. It should be coming out the first or second week of November, available for pre-order on, on Amazon very shortly, called Pandemic of Fear where I delineate culturally and psychologically how we got into this and how we can get ourselves out of it. Great stuff, brother. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Good to see you again. Appreciate the time, okay? Thank you, Steve. Good to see you too. You bet. Bye. Any reaction to that? In fact, I want to get reaction from you with the four kids in the schools right now. When you listen to that conversation, do you any parallels, anything hit home to you? Well, not specifically very much, but that's why I chose the particular school district I'm in. But when he says a lifetime of uh, of uh, problems, that's exactly the kind of people will, who who will always turn to government for help. So, this, so this a psyop. Is, it's all yeah. That's why you're tying the beginning. Mm-hmm. And that's my point. The beginning and end are perfectly tied up. It's all part of the plan, Steve. Mm-hmm. In other words. What they've done to the kids and how traumatized they are isn't a bug. It's not the downside exactly. of a noble intention or lie. It's the desired result because those they're now conditioned to rely on government for everything. The new serfdom. Hour two is next. All right, we're back again with Hour 2, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre and all of you. Let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox. Steve at stevedace.com is how you can email us if you want to do that. You can still go to stevedace.com, by the way, and sign our pledge. I've not gotten an update. I think yesterday we were about 2,500 short or just about 2,000 short of getting to 10,000. I'd like to get to 10,000 signees to that. Just because it's a nice round number. I guess if it stays at 78, 96, or whatever it was, that's fine too. But I'd like to see if we can get to 10,000. So look at our pledge, stevedace.com. It'll be up for a couple more days. Stevedace.com, Declaration of Independence from COVID Stan. I mean, what you just heard from Dr. Mark McDonald doesn't motivate you to be like, we have to end this once and for all. I, I guess I just don't know what will at this point. You're being experimented on. Are you yes. insulted yet? And and now they want to experiment on your children even more than they already have. So yes. All right. So check that out at stevedace.com. Steve at stevedace.com is how you can email us, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, at Steve Day Show. Look for me as well on MeWe, Parlor, Gab, and Getter. Look for clips of the show that are free of censorship and free to watch at rumble.com slash Steve Day Show. Again, that's Rumble.com slash Steve Day Show. Um, the Attorney General Merrick Garland is testifying today. One of my very best friends, Congressman Chip Roy, questioned him. Did you guys see this clip? Yep. I'm keeping track of it. Yeah. yeah. Questioned him on what the Department of Justice knows about the case happening in Loudoun County, Virginia. Just so you guys know, what's that like? Uh, 15 minutes yeah. from the Department of Justice, Loudoun yeah. County, Virginia. Yeah. Okay. All right. You, you can. S- you can see it from your home in Alaska. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Great reference. Which she never said, by the way, but great reference nevertheless. Okay. But um, he asked him under oath today what he knew about the case there of the male pretending to be a girl who had sexually assaulted now not one but two different girls inside either uh, locker rooms or restrooms in that school district. And if we had a, if we had a real media or anything even pretending to be, is it Luke Rosiak? Is that his name? Yeah. Yep. First of all, Luke Rosiak, God bless him, at the Daily Wire. wouldn't have broken this story. It would have been on the front cover of the Washington Post or 60 Minutes when we were kids. All right? But he'd be nominated for a Pulitzer yep. right now for what he has done with that story. He has broken that thing. God bless him, sky high. But apparently they didn't know anything about this over at the Department of Justice because when Congressman Roy asked 
Attorney General Merrick Garland about it today. He said he'd never even heard of the case. You believe that? No. Of course that's not true. But, you know, lying with forked tongue is a second language. But he's certain if you show up to your school board meeting and don't use the right tone, yes. you're a domestic terrorist. Yeah, yes, indeed. Indeed. All right. So um, I can't even remember how I ended up on that train of thought, but I, I thought that that was worth mentioning before we moved on with the rest of the show. Let's get to uh, Theology Thursday. Oh, first, let me mention, again, if you're a podcast listener, I try to do this each day. Please, if you haven't done this already, thank you to all of you who have, because it's a lot. But uh, more and more we could use because it helps the show to grow more and more, particularly via podcast. So hit, a, hit us with a five-star review if you like us. And also hit subscribe or follow, whichever applies to where you podcast from. So thanks to everybody that's done those two things for us already. Let's get to Theology Thursday, shall we? Uh, brought to you by Sweatblock. Um, in fact, no. Theology Thursday should be brought to you. We'll talk about Sweatblock later because we have a new partner here on the show. And I actually just started reading this book. And the name of the book is, And Then the End Will Come. All right. Uh, it's a book by a listener in our audience named Doug Cobb. And he absolutely believes that we're going to see Christ return in our lifetimes. Now, he's not alone. Because last January, when we were down at the Blaze doing shows while Aaron was on his honeymoon... Yeah. Our patriarch, Glenn Beck, made a similar prediction on the Days Group, as I recall, right? Yeah. Well, and not only that, the first time I ever met him, like two minutes That's into That's right. The, I forgot about that. He went full Ed Times. I was like, yes. all right, so, buckle up. <laughs> we're sitting there in the hall after everybody's production is done, and uh, Glenn comes up. You've not, you have, I've not no. even had a chance to introduce you to no. him yet. Glenn comes up, starts talking to me about something, and, and just mm. as I'm about to introduce you to him, he's like... He just goes into this whole eschatology end times oh, yeah. conversation, right? It was real. Yeah, it was It was real and it was spectacular. And that was your very first in-person introduction uh, to the one and only Glenn Beck. But um, the book is, hey, if you are feeling discouraged about the growing craziness and the evil in the world today, Doug has written a book that says, actually, you don't have to. And I, I, I'm fascinated with part, I, I've... I've my problem with eschatology, as I've said on the show so many times, is I've studied it too much and, and too many of the various viewpoints out there that it's just, it kind of gets to be word salad because I've read, I've read the three major views, I've read up on them quite a bit, and then I've read their critiques of the other views, and I found everybody's arguments all compelling simultaneously, all right? Um, but as I have Is also said allowed? recently, what to, yeah, yeah, well, I don't know if it's allowed or not. All right. I'm not saying I, I'm not saying my take is the correct one. I'm just saying that that is my reaction. I found all elements of all three of these views to be particularly compelling simultaneously. And that's a, that's a problem in trying to decipher where you're coming from, where at key moments they contradict one another. Right. Um, but I have told you that the last year plus of what I have witnessed going on, I, I can't think of anything historically in, in the history of the world. Where there has been this much level of mass delusion and confusion in the history of the world, on a global level, as we're seeing right now. And, and so, like I've said before, I, I have spent, I spent many a night this summer in past years where I would have been watching classic college football games from the 70s and 80s, getting ready for the season, many a night this summer in my basement, just searching on YouTube for end times videos and watching them, okay? Well, along those lines, Doug wants to tackle some of that subject matter in his new book, and then the end will come. Uh, you can find it on Amazon right now, or you can get it at and then the end dot com or then the end will come dot com and then the end will come dot com. Let me say it again because it's a long website and then the end will come dot com. You can get it there as well. And he's going to lay out the case. I'm, I'm only about 30 pages into this. But um, <clears throat> there's an angle to this that is typically associated with. um a post-millennial view that I find fascinating because I think he's going to he's going to marry it to a pre-millennial view. If I'm reading if I'm reading his tea leaves right, but again I'm only thirty pages in. Okay, so if you want to read the book, uh, it's and you can get it at and then the end will come dot com. All right, let's get to theology Thursday. 
<clears throat> and there is, yeah, I would say, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, men whose work, and some of them are people of great historical significance that are not with us any longer, like a Chesterton or um, uh, a Spurgeon, or if you want to go into the Wayback Machine, Todd well knows one of my favorite theologians is Augustine, okay? There, there, there's a core group of people, and I'm, and I'm always hesitant to name the contemporary people, just because someone will then find something stupid they wrote, okay, or something dumb that they did, right? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, or you end up with the 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 tragic ex post facto um, redux of who really was Ravi Zacharias, for example, okay? That's why I, I tend to talk about the old, long dead people I like the most because it kind of feels like the book's written on them and nothing can come out later on that makes offends us or makes us think, what in the Sam Hill was that? Or they took a position on some tertiary or second issue and now they're a heretic because that's our social media culture, right? Mm-hmm. But within that group, there have there are also several people, and you're, you're, I'm going to get emails asking me to name the contemporary people. I just want you to warn you up front, I'm not giving you any of the names. Not doing it. Why? Because for the first five years of the show, every time you asked me this, I gave you the name Ravi Zacharias. I'm not giving any more names. I'm not giving my own name, okay? No more names. Anybody that's alive or has only been dead within the last five years, I'm not giving you any names. You're totally on your own. I got enough of my own baggage. I got enough of my own problems with my own search histories and my own temptations and the own, my the, the my own issues that I have to overcome to bring to the table every single day. I just don't have the wherewithal now to accept anybody else's. So I'm not giving you any names. Don't bother asking. You won't get an answer. That'll be a waste of an email. All right. You want to ask me what I think about people that have been dead for at least 50 years? Well, you know what? I want to include Francis Schaefer. So we'll say 30 years. If they've been dead for at least 30 years, we can talk. That's my new requirement. They have to have been dead for at least 30 years. <laughs> if it's anybody still alive or only died in the last 30 years, I know nothing. Okay? But for the purposes of this conversation, and in the interest of full disclosure, I should mention that John Piper has, has been on that list for me. And... When I went through what I like to call like my spiritual boot camp and that whole renewing of my mind and I'm, I'm watching every show on TBN so that you didn't have to. <laughs> right? uh, I'm listening to the, or the dawn of the podcast era. I'm listening to everything I can find. And, and Piper was absolutely one of my Gibraltars, man. One of my go-tos, one of my rocks. So if you like this show, he should get some credit, I don't know, 10%, one, two, three, something. He's contributed something to it because he's contributed to the formation of my own worldview. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, for sure. So I, I say that anticipating that there, we, we, we may draw some differences in the topic that we're about to address with him. We did, again, just to reiterate, um, we did invite him to appear in this segment. We did not get a response. So I just want people to know that so that all righteousness was fulfilled, we did attempt to go to him, okay? I've not read this piece ahead of time, but boy, howdy, a lot of you have, because you have email, emailed it to me in the, uh, in the triple digits now. I'm going to read this and go through it in real time with you for the first time right now, live on the air for Theology Thursday. So this is Dr. John Piper. The headline is A Reason to be Vaccinated, Freedom. And I'm just going to reel it. I'm just going to read it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I feel the need to stop and say something, I will, okay? And Is there then, a money line on that, Aaron, on how many times he will feel the need? See, I'm not putting one because then he'll intentionally, he'll, he'll intentionally <laughs> he go past. Yeah. Yes, that's smart. You know I would just do it as smart. <laughs> yep. Yes, yes. Dude code. Dude code is in effect. Even during Theology Thursday, we must enforce the dude code, right? All right, here we go. My aim, John writes, uh, my, my aim in this article is to encourage Christians to be vaccinated if they can do so with good conscience and judicial or, or judicious medical warrant. The people I have especially in view are those who are not vaccinated because of fear of being out of step with people they respect and in step with people they don't admire. My message to them is simple. You are free. Let me start with that premise. It, it appears to me that he believes he's going after a form of idolatry. And we've talked about 
this kind of tribalistic idolatry too, right? Okay. Um, the great prophetess herself, known as Nicki Minaj, uh, recently addressed this when she said, I guess so if I'm standing in a street and a car's about to hit me and a Republican tells me to get out of the way, I don't listen. I just stand there and get hit by the car, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I think trying to practice empathy here and love my neighbor as I love myself because that's what I would want, right? I'd want the benefit of the doubt given to me. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you want that, Todd? He hasn't Aaron? written anything so far that would prevent Aaron, me from Aaron, doing Aaron, you that. would want that, right? Sure. So I take this, that he intends for this to be, hey, do, you know, your freedom is not meant to lock you into going along with a group or a tribe. I totally agree with that. We have a system in, in America built on individual God-given rights, right? Okay. God knows us individually, we, through Christ, we now can have an individual relationship with the Creator. So, okay, so far, so good. So I am not talking directly to anybody. If the shoe fits, put it on, check your conscience, consult your doctor, and go get vaccinated. If it doesn't, go tearfully and cheerfully on your way. Tearfully, because over 4.5 million people have died from COVID-19 worldwide, including over 700,000 Americans, and cheerfully because Christ makes it miraculously possible to love people by being sorrowful yet always rejoicing. So here's our first flawed premise. The, the first flawed premise is that if you choose not to get vaccinated, you should go away tearfully because you are somehow contributing to all of these deaths. Number one, um, we have had over 700,000 deaths. There have been over four and a half million deaths of COVID. However, when did we start vaccinating? Uh, well after those deaths started. Yes, yes, we did. Yeah. So uh, about, I, I want to say we were somewhere around a half a million deaths. No, it wasn't that high. About 300,000 deaths at the end of the year. So here in the States. Not to mention that. This is a new column, and a lot of vaccinated people have died. Yes. Yeah, so that would, this is actually written on October the 19th, so yeah. it's two days old. So, so right away, the idea that you bear the brunt, I, I've, well, I've spoken about this in context like CRT. The idea that there is collective sin is not biblical. In the New Testament, there is not collective sin. In the Old Testament, there was, because God was in covenant with a particular nation. But even within that covenant, there were sanctuaries you could go to, run to. There were, there were rituals and sacrifices you could make to absolve yourself of, of that sin. There was, you, you, were, you could still practice faithfulness and be rewarded for it at an individual level, even while corporately around you, the culture may be getting punished for violating the covenant. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, in the New Covenant, there is no thing, such thing as a corporate sin. So you're saying he's just doing a, another version, another riff on a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Yes, yes. This idea, so his numbers are already flawed because he's attributing these deaths to a time, all the deaths, before we even had vaccines, mm -hmm. before they were even readily available. Secondly, then what a, what, children, children of a certain age cannot get vaccinated. So then at what age then are the unvaccinated children responsible for the deaths that they have caused in John Piper's economy here? I mean, where we, where, how, far do we want, how far do we wish to go with this? I guess we'll continue on and find out. Before I get the biblical argument for radical freedom, consider a few statistics that fuel the fire which this article was cooked. Nearly all COVID-19 deaths in the United States were people who weren't vaccinated. This article's from May. I'm not even going to read the rest of the citation. He's, he's, this article is from May. He wrote, I would have told you in May that the majority of deaths in America overwhelmingly were the unvaccinated. Do you know why I would have told you that in May? Because it would have been Be true. Because it was true. It's not true now. We hadn't reached Delta variant yet in May. We hadn't reached the Sun Belt wave yet in May. We were not in any form of seasonality yet in May. Right away, and this is the very first stat, guys. The very first one. And it's so wrong and so out of place, I won't even read the rest of it because it starts with a fallacy. And frankly, if it was by anybody else not named John Piper, you wouldn't keep reading. I wouldn't say. keep reading the rest of this now. Okay. And I wouldn't call it a fallacy. I'd call it a lie, a deception. 
But because I've listened to literally hundreds of hours of his sermons, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But you're starting with a stat. This is a pandemic that is 19 months old. Now, it's older than that, if we're being honest. Mm -hmm. But it's been 19 months from a public policy standpoint. And you're starting with a stat that's five months old. That's, that's a quarter of the time of the entire pandemic. You're already outdated. John, stay in your lane. John, you're over your skis already, brother. Here's the next stat. He's quoting from January 18th. He's quoting another stat in Montana. Again, pre-Delta. And then he does this. He actually reprints the deceptive statistics in these states. Now, this is a deception. One of the things I have found going through these state dashboards trying to figure out vaccinated versus unvaccinated is they give you the cumulative numbers. See, Mara Eliason tried to fact check me on Massachusetts. Well, only 0.07% of deaths in Massachusetts since January have been fully vaccinated. I never, my tweet never said anything about the amount of deaths in January, since January in Massachusetts. It explicitly said the opposite. It especially, it especially said last week. The tweet said last week. And last week, the number was 45% were fully vaccinated. Last week. He's now, he quotes the, Pencil, the Pennsylvania Department of Health reports that between January 1st and October 4th, 93% of COVID-19 related deaths were in unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated people. First of all, they weren't doing mass vaccinations in Pennsylvania yet as of January 1. They were just beginning. Secondly, again, this is all pre-Delta. I don't think it's too much to ask. He's retired now, right? Correct. So he's not preaching every Sunday, preparing sermons, running a church over there at Bethlehem Baptist in Minnesota anymore, right? Correct. Is it too much to ask, therefore, for, a, for, for John in his free time as a retiree to Google Delta variant? Is John unaware of why we're having, why are we doing boosters? Because pre-Delta variant, the vaccines were working great. Post-Delta variant, what's happened? Not. Not great. That's why we're doing boosters here, the UK, Canada, Israel. That's why we're doing boosters. Because none of the data prior to the 1st of August is relevant to the situation we're in right now. Would it be fair if I stood here on March 1, barely two months since we started mass vaccinating people, and attributed the trends of what was going on before we even started vaccinating people in the previous year no. to the efficacy of the vaccines? What would we call that? Not a deception, fair. a lie, yes. propaganda? Yes. That is exactly what he does right here. That's what he does right here. The cumulative numbers are not relevant. Facts and trends from January and April and May are not relevant. They're not doing boosters because the vaccine you got in June still works, guys. They're not doing boosters because the vaccine you got in January still works. Why are they doing boosters? Because it doesn't. This is already built on a lie. I don't know John Piper other than listen to hundreds of hours of his sermons. So I don't know him well enough to know whether he's just this bad and uninformed at this. That's possible. Or if he's in on it and worked over, I don't know the answer to that. That's why we invited him on. Because I anticipated, without ever reading a word, I anticipated this is what he was going to do. And I wanted to ask him face to face, John, have you heard of Delta variant? John, why are they doing boosters? John, do you know what natural immunity is? No? Because, John, you're always the guy that used to say, I'm going to stay out of politics, not my lane. Take your own advice, brah. You know what? The rest of this, as I scroll through it, is, is theological pablum. He wants to talk about the freedom that Paul exercises, urges us to exercise 
righteously in Corinthians and in Romans. Peter does it. Uh, Peter writes in one of his epistles, you, the brethren, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your sinful natures, right? Here's the problem with that. His, his exegetical conclusion, I, I, guys, guys, I had to cancel two speaking engagements this month because I've got issues going on with all three of my kids. Last spring, my wife and I were openly discussing whether we were going to remain married. Spring of 2020. I'm I'm not... <laughs> One, don't replace John Piper with me is the moral of that story. Amen? Amen. Okay. So don't, don't trade in the golden um, calf for, um, uh, for the butter cow or the golden um, uh, salamander. I'm not your new hero, number one. Number two, if, if therefore I am now, based on the things I just told you about me, if I am now in a place that I can, in three to 10 minutes, absolutely annihilate and destroy a hermeneutical exercise by the, in the one and only Dr. John Piper, we're freaking doomed. If John Piper can get worked over by the spirit of the age at this level, we're toast. If God's calling me in from the bullpen, hey, somebody's got to go ch uh, fact check uh, John up there in Bethlehem, Minneapolis. Uh, calling the kid that, that notices all the yoga pants at the gym, to, born to the 15-year-old mom. If we're there, and it kind of feels like we're there. It does. Remember what I said last yesterday? The hour is late. If you were wondering, what's the moment? what's the moment to go all in? What's the moment to risk it? What's the moment to risk my, my livelihood, my comfort? Because I don't want to do it for nothing, but I know at some point I have to. What's the moment? This kind of feels like this might be the moment. A lot of those days I spent in those gyms, working those 100 pounds off, was listening to John Piper on my, in my earbuds. You've gone back and told 2011, Steve, hey, about 10 years from now, you're going to be pimp slapping him up and down the dial for just a complete and total wad of BS. He's firing out there based on a complete and total sham lie. I'd have said, you're nuts. And yet here we are. There's no need to read the rest of it. There's no need to go over the rest of it because it's the whole opening salvo is built on a lie. John Piper tries to use the same arguments Mara Eliason was using at NPR, which isn't an argument. It's a deception. It's not an argument. It's a deception. The, the, the serpent wasn't making arguments in the garden. He was practicing deception. Arguments are when we agree on what the material facts are, but maybe, or statistics or data, but then we maybe have different understandings of why those things are true or what to do about them. That's an argument. This isn't an argument. This is deception. John is ultimately deceiving you or he is himself deceived. And it could be that he himself is deceived and that's why he's deceiving you. But this is a deception. It's not an argument. And I actually am sorry. You guys have any thoughts on this? Todd, I told you he wouldn't make it through the first yeah. paragraph. Um, I didn't read it, and I was certain he wouldn't make it through. He goes on to say, when people respond to this increasing, increasingly clear reality, meaning all of those junk stats that he just threw out, by pointing to untrustworthy and disreputable government and medical leaders, I respond, quote, that's a non sequitur. So if Rachel Levine tells me to jab up because it's good for my health. It's a non sequitur to think 
hmm, this mentally ill person is telling me to do something. Maybe I should think through this thing Get a second once opinion. more time. That's yeah. a non sequitur. Yeah. He goes on to say, the team called the team called vaccination just made a first down, even if monkeys are holding the chance. For friends around the world who don't know what American football is, that means it's a win is a win, even if the coaches and referees are incompetent. That entire introductory salvo is beneath John Piper. Incredibly disappointing. Beneath the hundreds of hours of sermons I, I listen. Yeah. Maybe he's not that man anymore. Not, I don't know. I don't know what's gone on here between this, the uh, flimsiness a couple of years ago on, on a biblical view on race. I used air quotes there. And, and it, he had something like this as well with the, with the election. Maybe it's just in these moments, this, this, is, not where, this is not where he's gifted the most but it's completely beneath him i'm not really mad i'm just uh i'm just disappointed i'm disappointed we have devolved to the point that i can come in here and absolutely destroy his attempt to make an argument here and and you know what this is a reminder to me and it, it's something i've been praying a lot recently and to pray it harder father let me finish well because most men don't You know, there's never a great time to be all sweaty in public, especially because it tends to happen at the most inopportune times of first date or, you know, the whole argument we had yesterday, should it be actually the second date that's more nerve wracking than the first one? Because now there's expectations, right? Um, or maybe it's uh, a job interview. That's a terrible time to go in all sweaty. Um, when the cops say, hey, license and registration, don't want to be all sweaty then, right? Then they might Correct. wonder... Maybe we're something was more going on here than going uh, forty in a in a in a yes. twenty five, right? Don't be sweaty all then, okay? Or it's happened to me before uh, speaking engagements in front of large crowds. I don't really get so nervous anymore. In fact, it's adrenaline, but those lights can get really hot. At least that's the excuse I'm going with. All right. That's why you want to try our friends over at Sweat Block. Their antiperspirant wipes, they are stronger and more effective than most clinical antiperspirants out there. Uh, just wipe your pits down at night, go to bed, get up the next morning, do your thing you normally do to get ready to go, and you should be good to go for several days before you have to do it again. Uh, and they guarantee it. They've also got, by the way, their own deodorant. I've tried it. It's fantastic. They've got deodorant lotions for some of their more, some of those more sensitive regions that can get a little swampy. So if you want to try any of their great products or try them all, get 20% off right now when you go to sweatblock.com and use my last name, DACE, as your promo code. Sweatblock.com with the promo code DACE. Again, 20% off at sweatblock.com. Let me just take a second here. I want to just say on a personal level, the last segment we just did, and this and this is saying something, considering some of the subject matter that we have had to be forced and compelled, the levels of darkness that we are confronting daily now, that last segment is, is, is maybe the most disappointed I've been in the last couple of years. And that's saying something. And that is saying something. I had a feeling it was going to be bad, given how many of you had emailed me. And if you thought there's no way you hadn't read it, I think you can tell from my reaction to it. I had not read it. It was worse than I anticipated it was going to be. When a brilliant man begins citing statistics to make his case that are at best sloppily irrelevant. That's the best we could say. That's the best thing we could say. And if there's one thing we're not called to be when it comes to preaching and teaching the word of God, it's sloppily irrelevant. Right? Kind of sums up a lot of the preaching of the last few decades in terms Although, of... Although, boy, it does... Todd is right. That's... It's kind of over the target, really. Yeah. But that's the best we can say. Sloppily irrelevant. The worst we can say is he's deceiving you. And then you have to ask yourself, why? Is he himself a deceiver or is he himself deceived? And that's why he's now deceiving others. Likely, given his track record, the latter. But he's deceiving nevertheless, right? Yeah. So this isn't an argument. What John Piper wrote is a deception. 
And the only thing left to debate now is whether he is in on the deception or he himself is deceived. But I, I've seen this trend before. Early in my career, when I watched a lot of Christian leaders get in bed with Mitt Romney and not support Mike Huckabee. Hey, I know Mike Huckabee didn't have the greatest record on fiscal conservatism, so you remember that caucus cycle. Very much. If anybody said, hey, you know what, man, Mike is weak on fiscal issues, I'm supporting Fred Thompson. Did I argue with any of those people? Debate any of those people? No. No. I said, God bless you. Yeah. In fact, we had those people on. Had Fred Thompson and all his people on. When your answer was, though, I'm going to go support the guy who literally gave gay marriage to America and Mitt Romney. Literally gave it to America. Brought gay marriage to America. Mitt Romney did. Who shut down Catholic charities because they didn't want to put kids in homes that didn't have a mom and a dad, but had two moms and two dads. He did that before they're doing it now. And had Obamacare provide taxpayer-funded abortion and then lie about it. I'm sorry, Freudian slip, Romney Care. And then lied about it even though you could actually go on the website for Romney Care in Massachusetts and the list of coverages on their website said abortion. I mean, Mitt would just lie about stuff you could just verify, but they just like hitting like one link. He would just lie about stuff he just said like yesterday on national TV. He then would just turn around and just lie, even after you played the clip about him lying. And when that, when that election was over, and I saw a lot of big name Christian leaders, Tom Minnery at Focus on the Family, Richard Land, Southern Baptist Convention, and I got all these guys on my local show in Iowa. Do you remember these interviews? Oh, I remember one well. I remember what I was doing, where I was listening to it, and how uncomfortable it got. And I did not intend for it to get uncomfortable. I really thought, I'm a baby Christian. These guys have been at this for decades. Is There must be something I'm missing. Maybe there's something I don't know. And so I just started asking them questions. And it's when it was clear that it, it wasn't anything that I didn't know. They were just deceiving us. They had, they had decided that they had arrived to a point that they got to make political calculations and tell the masses what to think. And, and, and it was a noble, frankly like Fauci, noble lie. That Huckabee couldn't win, Romney could. You don't want McCain as the nominee. So I'll lie to you about Romney to avoid McCain. The noble lie. Haven't we seen a whole pattern of these? Let me lie to you about the efficacy of this and the efficacy of that in order to get you to do the things that we think you need to do to make should, yourself better. They should officially change the name of the Republican Party to the noble lie. Indeed. And in these interviews, what ended up happening is a, an, an absolute baby Christian, just by asking earnest questions of trying to get answers, pulled the pants down on some very preeminent Christian leaders. It's one of the reasons why I'm blacklisted. You don't see me get invited to speak at these events. And if you guys ever wondered, why don't you, you guys will send me emails. Why aren't you speaking at, you know, the Family Research Council event? And all This is why. This is why. Okay. I mean, I mean, Tony Perkins told me a lie about Mitt Romney on the phone directly to me. I had a, a friend of mine and his try to broker a peace between us and he lied to me right on the phone and I called him on it. That actually happened. It did happen. So if you want to know why I'm not on the big speaker circuit and haven't spoken, the, I'm, this is the real reason why is these interviews that I did. And word got out, hey, that kid won't play ball. Don't go, don't, 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 don't help him. Don't push his career. Don't advance it. That kid won't play ball. He's, you know, he's a purist. Because that's a terrible thing to strive for within Christianity, apparently. Purity. So I haven't had one of those moments for a long time because I just kind of moved on and said, I'm just going to do my own thing best I can. Finish my mission, finish my race. Let all those guys do whatever they're going to do. When I agree with them, I'll agree with them. When I don't, I'm just going to keep my head down and run my race, right? We just had one of those moments here on the show for the first time in a long time. And, and I'm just crushed. I'm just crushed. So we're back on October 21st with where we were the very first 
Monday in January when we came back from Christmas break and we announced what the theme of the show was this year? The answer is us. No heroes. No leaders. You're looking for the hero of the story? The Marine who was standing outside that storefront yeah. as, as those punks tried robbing it and just beat their living asses. Didn't call the cops, didn't wait for didn't wait for the heroes to show up, didn't wait for the leaders to arrive. Just took that whole we the people thing into his own hands. I'll just whoop that ass myself. I'm a Marine. That's what I got trained to do. All enemies, former foreign and domestic. Yes. These look like some domestic enemies here. So I'll 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 handle this. Thank you. And I, folks, no heroes, no leaders. We're just going to have to do this ourselves. Let's get to three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? Question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on The Steve Day Show. That would be a good time for me to think of three questions on The Steve Day Show. (laughs) Question number one, what's a food you always think is going to be great but always disappoints? And what's one food that you never think is going to be great but... Always is great. Until recently, I would have said chicken parm. It always sounds good, but it, it's usually either it's the noodles or the breading or the chicken. It, it just, at numerous restaurants I've tried, it's not delivered. I, we were, wife and I were at an event a couple of months ago and it was prepaid, so I didn't want to complain. But a lot of the other things that were on the menu of choices that you could go to weren't I weren't I wasn't big on. So I thought at least at least if the chicken's good, I'll get some good protein out of it. And the chicken parm was incredible. In fact, we're going back there for dinner tomorrow. So I would say chicken parmesan. The chicken parm has disappointed me on numerous occasions. Um, and then something I think isn't going to be good. Um, and it doesn't have to be. Don't think it's going to be good, but not not very whelming. Pretty, pretty underwhelming, but always ends up defying your expectations. Um, I'm going to let you go while I think about that one. Well, that one, it's, it's going to run counter to your instincts. Uh, for me, it's uh, probably pizza on the ladder. Like, I'm not, I'm not a, I like Italian. I don't love Italian. Mm-hmm. And where a lot of people's go-to is pizza, I'd rather have chicken wings or something like that. But I've never, like... Boy, that pizza sucked. You know, it's just like, okay, Mm -hmm. I guess we'll have pizza. But then I was like, I'm always fulfilled. It's always good. I like it. Um, The other way around. That I need a little moment now. What's So for me, it's it's, uh, pork rinds. Those always sound good to me. And then they're like kind of chewy and they stick to the top top of your mouth. And they don't really taste that great either. A thing that I I think is going to be okay ends up always satisfying and even more so. Culver's Butter Burgers. I'm just getting, I mean, I haven't had one for a while, but that was the first thing that popped into my head when I was asking this question of myself. Uh, you never really, you just think it's going to be another fast food? No, no. I think they cook them the same way Jesse Kelly tells you. They, they to, flat, on, the, on the flat? On the flat the iron, the flat you know, iron, cook them yeah. in, their, in their own grease. Yeah. That's that's great. Okay, that's a, that's a good one. I can buy that one, yeah. That's a really good, I you answered my question. Generally speaking, though, what always sounds really good to me but often disappoints is hamburgers generally yeah. speaking i'm at that point if now they're, where if they're not juicy yeah it's, yeah i just uh i think uh I, and i would like wolf down any 20 years ago i mean burger it doesn't matter burger me but yeah i don't know if i'm becoming a snob or what this guy's got a number one book and now he suddenly finds himself a, a connoisseur of burgers go ahead question two uh, would you rather have Iowa's offensive line, Wisconsin's quarterback, or go or go eleven and one with a four touchdown loss to your biggest rival? I'd rather go eleven and one with a four touchdown loss to my biggest rival because after fifteen years, I've accepted my fate. I've realized all men, every man has its limits. I have mine. I don't even think that game even exists. So we would actually be eleven and zero in my mind. So I'd take eleven and zero every single year. Uh, I think 
I'd rather have Wisconsin's quarterback only because he's just Wisconsin's quarterback. He was supposed to be more. This guy could basically just like shuffle the paperwork like any other, many other, not all of them, Wisconsin quarterbacks do. So I think he just needs to resign themselves to the fact that they don't have the glory boy they thought they had and just get back to work being Wisconsin. I'd rather be 11 and 1. Question number three, what's your idea of the ultimate road trip? Um, having a Madden-like cruiser yeah. and just picking, um, just picking the, the, the college football game every Saturday that I want to be at. And I've got skyboxes, so I don't have to worry about crowds and bathrooms and all that other stuff, okay? Because to me... The experience I have watching the game at home now is so superior, not having to navigate through that, that it's just not as fun being at the game if I can't mirror that on some level because you're constantly, do I go to the bathroom now because of the lines? When do I get back? You know, all these things you got to navigate, right? You know, so um, having a Madden-like cruiser, picking the college football game every week I want to be at, and then I've got like, I've got a box or I'm in I'm in the press uh, the press box for all of those, so I, I I know I've got a seat and a chance at in a in a urinal if I need one. Can we back up a little bit? Todd said he'd rather have his quarterback than going eleven and one. And and not eleven and one. There's you're missing a very big part of your own question. Eleven and one and what? Losing by four touchdowns to your big rival. So you'd rather. So what's what's the record that you would trade? You took those team, those specific. I'm just saying that our quarterback now is just our. Wisconsin always has that kind of quarterback. It hardly ever has a quarterback that stands out. That's. I was just accepting your terms. It could have been different. Okay, what's your ideal ultimate road trip? Uh, I've str- I've talked about this in a different context. I believe I'm on. Uh, political questions before but the opportunity is going to be coming up for both both the world cup and the olympics will be in north america within the next 10 years there you go. Yeah. so yeah that and something along the lines of steve get an awesome you know camper kind of thing mm-hmm. yeah absolutely uh did you were you gonna say something steve no i was gonna do my last live read oh go ahead okay um you know uh, it is it, it's never um, a, a relaxing experience to put your home on the market or to try to buy your next house. And then there, of course, happens to be these unprecedented times. Bing! Thank you. Uh, that it, it gets a little easier. Actually, it gets a lot easier, though. If you've got an agent that you can trust and if you want to know where you would find such a person, the name of the website says it all. Head over to realestateagentsitrust.com. This is a company that Glenn Beck and his associates started a few years ago because they kept running into real estate agents they couldn't trust. All right, so that's why they created a website called realestateagentsitrust.com so they could find some trustworthy agents. And it just mushroomed from there to the point now that just about anywhere in the country that you're looking to move to or from, we can probably hook you up with one of those, a real estate agent you can trust at this website, realestateagentsitrust.com. Once more, that's realestateagentsitrust.com. I would get an RV and just spend an entire summer in the Southwest. Hmm. Or a private plane. Road trip. Oh, it was a road trip. That's right. Okay. I love the whole Madden Cruiser idea, though. I always thought that was so cool back in the day. And with today's technology and everything else, I mean, you could have everything sitting in there. Yeah, I know. know? I know. All right, we're back at it again tomorrow, noon to 2 Eastern, right after Glenn Beck, here on Blaze TV. Until then, John 317.